All right, so welcome, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk about fast and reliable builds with Gradle and Maven. Um, my name is Mark Philipp, I am um, from Germany, I, work, I live in Karlsruhe. Um, I work for Gradle Inc., the company behind Gradle as a software engineer. I'm also the team lead of the JUnit team, so in case you've ever written a JUnit test, um, yeah, you've used JUnit, so I'm glad you did. Um, you can reach me on Twitter, on GitHub, and yeah, there's, there's a homepage where you can also find some more about me. So Gradle Inc. is the company behind Gradle. Um, our, our vision, our mission is kind of to build happiness. Um, so we want you to be happy with your build. And for that, it has to be fast and reliable and yeah, pleasant to work with. Our products are, of course, the Gradle build tool, which is completely free and, and open source. Um, Apache licensed, but also we have a commercial product it's called Gradle Enterprise, which builds on, on top of Gradle and now also Maven um, to provide additional insights and a build cache um, to speed up your builds. So by the way, if you're interested, I have some, some stickers with me. I put them up here, so in case you want to grab some after the talk, please do. First of all, how do builds affect developer productivity? Why are we here today? Why is it even important? So first of all, builds are kind of there to fail at some point, right? If you made a mistake, if something doesn't compile, if a test is broken, um, you want your build to fail. That's a valid reason for the build to fail. And about 20% of builds fail because of such code defects. And According to the numbers our customers gave us, about 5 to 10% of a team's capacity is spent on fixing the build due to such valid reasons, um, like fixing the production code or fixing a test, that sort of thing. So it does affect developer productivity because you need to spend time on fixing things in the build. But also another factor is slowness. So every additional minute a build takes, um, influences the amount of time you need to wait for the build, you need to um, yeah, spend fixing it. So the numbers our customers gave us show about 4% for each extra minute of reduced capacity. So that's quite a lot. So you want your builds to be fast. Another factor is unreliability. So if you spend a lot of time debugging problems in your build itself, so not actually in the production code or, or your test code, that's kind of wasted time. You don't want that. You want to be able to rely on your build 100% and, and trust it. So you don't want to spend that much time debugging it. If there's a problem, you want to be fast. You want to find out the root cause um, as, as fast as possible. So this is why you want your build to be fast and reliable. How do we achieve fast builds? What is faster? Well, basically, as, as builds are concerned, faster is doing less, avoiding stuff that doesn't need to be done, basically. So in a build, that's achieved by reusing results of previous builds. There's two, two ways to do that. Um, one is incremental builds. lets you reuse results from a previous build on the same machine for the next build. So usually, if you have a decent-sized project, if you make a change, you only touch a few files, and all the rest has not been touched, doesn't have to be recompiled, ideally. Of course, it's, if it's a downstream dependency, it does have. And figuring that out is what incremental builds are all about. Which parts do we have to rebuild for this change? And the build cache takes this caching stuff a step further, um, so it allows you to reuse results from any previous build, basically. Uh, as far as build tools are concerned, I'm going to talk about Gradle and Maven today, and uh, this is one of the areas, incremental builds, where Gradle really excels. Gradle is built for that purpose, basically. It knows about all the inputs and outputs of all tasks. It uh, is very good at figuring out which task has to be rerun, um, even supports task, tasks by design that um, support incremental execution. So, for example, compiling Java in Gradle is incremental. So it only compiles those class files that need to be recompiled. And for Maven, it, it's kind of, it is possible, but you really have to know what you're doing. It's, it's not that safe. So usually 
you call your Maven build with clean as the first phase. So for Cradle, that means Cradle can reuse results of the last time this build ran on this machine. That's how we can leverage an incremental build. But we can do better than that. Why not reuse the results of any time and any build that ran anywhere? So that's, that's kind of the vision behind the build cache. And even better, we want to do this for Maven and for Gradle builds. This is a performance comparison of, of a large Java multi-project that we use for our performance tests. It has 1,000 sub-projects. Each has, I think, 1,000 lines of code or something like that. And um, the same project is built using Maven and Gradle. Um, Maven is shown in blue here on the slide and Gradle in red. Um, and this is different scenarios, um, like a clean assemble, for example. Uh, let's focus on the two uh, charts on the right, so clean test. And as you can see, clean test cached, so executing the same thing uh, twice, but with cache enabled, um, achieves a similar speed up for Gradle and for Maven. But still, Gradle is, is faster by, by a lot. So of course, we're kind of opinionated. I work for Gradle. So we still think Gradle is the best build tool out there. So we should all switch to Gradle. But of course, we, we recognize, we acknowledge that people, some people prefer Maven. Some people don't have the time to worry that much about their build tool. And they would just want it to work. Um, so we built this for Maven as well. OK, how do you use it? The build cache for Gradle is actually built into Gradle. It's uh, free to use. All you need to do is pass minus minus build cache to the build. And that enables the local build cache on your machine. And you will see results coming from cache because of that. So it's, this is already there. On, if you have ever used Gradle, it's already built in. And it works out of the box for Java, Groovy, Scala, C++, and Swift projects. Um, and it supports caching of the most crucial tasks that take the longest time, like compilation, testing, and verification tasks. And in addition to that, um, we also provide a, a high-performance remote backend that you can use for Gradle. Um, and there's a Docker image that's public that you can use to set up your own remote build cache node. So a remote build cache node allows you to share build cache uh, entries across machines, across developers, um, from CI and, and local builds, uh, all that. So this is kind of what Gradle provides already, and which is free. For Maven, it's actually part of our commercial product. So we just released it in March. It's part of Gradle Enterprise. And uh, right now, it supports uh, Java compilation, test execution using Surefire and Failsafe, the Java doc plugin, JaxB, and CheckStyle. But we will probably add more, more supported plugins um, as we see fit um, according to what our customers need. All right. So let's do a quick demo. So I'm going to use JNet5 here because I happen to be familiar with it. Um, and JNet5 is a Gradle build. And I'm going to do this on master using uh, the minus minus build cache flag here. I'm just going to execute build. All right. As you can see, it was quite fast. Um, it was able to reuse 40 tasks from cache, and 82 were up to date. That's because I executed uh, a similar build previously here on master. Now, what you do often, I guess, is switching a branch. If you use Git, you do that all the time. Um, so let me do that as well. Let's use this one. And switching a branch often means a lot of inputs have changed. Maybe it's based on an old version of master or whichever branch you use for, de for developing. And running the build again on your local branch can be quite costly. But since we have the build cache enabled, and I've, I've, I ran this build before, it's still quite fast. We still get 40 tasks from cache, even though their inputs have changed. Um, because on this branch, a lot of inputs have changed on, on, in a project that's used by all the other sub-projects. And um, yeah, so that's quite a nice speed up. Um, we can even 
simulate uh, having no existing outputs here locally by doing a clean. So normally you don't have to do clean in Gradle because Gradle knows uh, what to rebuild. So having done that, though, has removed all my local build folders, all the output, all the class files, and running it with the build cache again will, uh, as you can see, load more tasks from the cache and than before. We had 40 before. We have 76 now. Um, all those were loaded from, from cache and not used. So it's not an incremental build. It's a fresh build on, on a clean um, working directory. This, those 38 up-to-date tasks actually came from uh, a plugin that just doesn't have any inputs on certain sub-projects, and so it's always up-to-date. Um, so don't worry about those for now. All right, um, what else? This is Gradle. Um, I can show you the same thing for, for Maven. I'm also going to use JUnit, but the JUnit 4 project, which happens to be on Maven. And I can use uh, Maven Clean Verify. But before I do that, actually, let me show you the configuration. So for Cradle, the minus minus build cache flag was enough. Uh, for Maven, you have to do some additional configuration. So in my local .mvn folder, I have an extensions XML here. And I register the Cradle Enterprise Maven extension um, using a certain version. Uh, I'm using a locally built version here. But if you use a release, it's deployed to Maven Central, so you don't have to set up anything else. It's very convenient to use. And in addition to that, since it requires Gradle Enterprise, you have to set up a Gradle Enterprise server. Um, in this case, I'm just using a local server here, and um, I'm configuring that in the Gradle Enterprise XML in the .mvm folder. That's all I need um, just to enable caching for my project here. So and I'm, I'm starting with a, with a clean cache. And uh, so now let me run the build. OK. The generate docs profile just enables Java doc and check style in addition. So we can also see these here. So the first time this build runs with a clean cache, obviously all, all goals have to be executed. Now tests are executed, and now we're doing Java doc. Now we're doing check style. OK, finished. So it's, it's not a big build. It's a single project. It, it takes about 21, 22 seconds to build it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not that big. But you can imagine if you have a multi-project build, that this can be quite a larger number, obviously. So let's, let's run it again without any changes just to, to get a feeling for how fast we can get. And um, yeah, as you can see now, 13 goals were there, eight were executed, but five were actually loaded from cache, um, saving at least 14 seconds. We can uh, see, look at the output. So for example, the Maven compiler plugin, the compilation of the main sources was loaded from cache, so was uh, compiling the test sources. Um, also, executing the tests was unnecessary because there was no, were, were no changes loaded from cache. So that saved about six seconds. And also Java doc here and check style. So that's quite a nice speed up. Um, of course, you will benefit more in a larger project in an amount of time than here. All right. By the way, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask at any time don't have to wait until the end. So OK, let me explain how this works. Um, so the first step is calculating a cache key. And for that, we take into account all the inputs of a task or goal. Um, so for example, for the Java compile task in Gradle, this would be all the source files, all the compiler flags, basically everything that affects the output. And then we, we hash all that and compute a cache key for it. Once we've done that, we can check the cache if this cache entry is present. If not, basically what we store under the cache key after the task or goal has been executed is all its outputs. For the Java compile task, this is all the class files in their file st structure and then all the subfolders and everything. And that's basically what comprises the cache entry. And basically, once you've done that, it's, it's a simple cache, basically. You have a key, you have some value, 
and you just need to extract the outputs when you reuse it in the right location. That's the, the underlying principle. All right. I've talked briefly about a local and a remote cache. Uh, now, let, let me give you a typical scenario how you would use these. So we have a developer here who wants to build something. He wants to execute a goal. And the first thing we do is compute the cache key, and then we check the local cache, if this entry is already present or not, using the cache key. In this case, we have never executed this goal before, so it's a miss. Um, we don't have anything in the local cache. What Gradle or the Maven extension would then do is check the remote cache, if one is configured. Um, and in this case, it's also a miss. The cache entry is not present. Well, now we have to do some actual work and execute the task or goal, which we do. And after it's done, we write its outputs to the cache. In this case, only local cache. You could also write it to the remote cache, but we recommend only doing that from the CI server, because on the CI server, it's very unlikely that someone changes the files while the build is running. So you could, in theory, corrupt a cache entry if you edit the files while the build is running, because it might not pick up that change, or it might pick up that change too early, that sort of thing. OK, so now we've stored it in the remote cache and the local cache of one developer, because the CI build ran. Now, another developer comes and wants to execute a local build, and first checks the local cache. It's not there. It's a miss. But after checking the remote cache, we can see, OK, we can read it from there. So basically, what we do is we download the outputs. Um, we extract them at the expected location of the goal, and we don't need to execute it again. But we store it in the local cache for the next time this build runs on this local machine. That's how the local and remote cache kind of play together and how you can share outputs across developer workstations and with CI. All right. So this was the build cache. But the build cache, in our opinion, is not enough. Uh, you need something more to be able to keep a build fast and um, to find out what makes it slow or debug problems with builds faster. And to us, um, we have to fulfill these requirements. We want to be able to monitor build regressions and performance improvements even over time. That's one of the things we want to do. And um, both builds that are done locally by developers and on CI, because both affect um, developer productivity. Like waiting on CI is something you don't want to spend that much time on, but waiting locally is even worse sometimes because you want to you know, push this stuff um, to the remote Git repository and to be able to work on the next thing. Um, so both kind of slow you down and affect your, uh, yeah, your productivity. And we want to be able to have insights into reliability and performance of builds. And to us, the answer to that is called build scans. A build scan is something that uh, is integrated into Gradle, and the Maven extension also provides. And a build scan is something that is acquired during a build, but is persistent. So it's a persistent record of what happened during a build. And uh, you get a URL in the, at the end of the build that you can share with your coworkers, and they can help you, for example, debug a problem or find out what, why your build was so slow. You don't have to uh, copy and paste your console output or anything like that. You can just like share the URL, and they can take a look. And it's intended to be used by developers and build engineers alike. Um, Oh, that was the wrong direction. Sorry about that. All right. So for Gradle, it's, as I said, it's already kind of built in. All you have to do is do minus minus scan on a, on a Gradle build. And at the end of the build, you will get a build scan URL. In this case, I'm, this is a public URL. This is just the, the public instance that we provide for free, which you can use for Gradle and for Maven builds. If you have Gradle Enterprise, you can host the Gradle Enterprise server on your own servers, you have your own infrastructure, you get kind of a, a private build scan URL that you can also just share with coworkers, that you don't have to upload your data to some, some place that's visible to the world, at least in theory. 
For Maven, you have to do a little more. I, as I've shown, you have to um, register the extension in extensions XML. That was the part I, I sh I've shown in the demo. But then, um, by default, it's always going to publish. Um, so if you run a regular Maven Clean Verify, for example, you get this um, build scan URL in the end, which you can then open and take a look at. All right, enough slides. Let's take a look at the demo. OK, as you've already maybe already seen, the last builds I, I ran here already have build scan URLs at the end. So I'm, I'm, I've used some local instance, the local Gradle, Gradle Enterprise server I've talked about. So I can just open that, maybe enlarge it a bit. And yeah, here I see basically a summary of a Maven build scan, because this is the JNet4 project, which uses Maven. I see the version of Maven and the version of the Gradle Enterprise Maven extension here. I get a summary of the goals that were executed, um, ordered by the, the longest first. Um, yeah, some summary of total build time, which projects were used, which is kind of boring in this case. It's just one project. I can see the, the plugins that were used here. I get an overview of the switches I've used. Um, everything was off here, so not very interesting. But for example, if I had used minus minus offline, this would be on. Um, I can see some details about the infrastructure this was, was executed on, in this case, my, my local machine here. And you can see, for example, the max JVM heap size, which for some larger builds might indicate already a problem if it's too small. Why, is, why was it so slow? Um, yeah, and for each of these, you can dig deeper. You can like explore the timeline, and this gives you an overview of all the goals that were executed in this Maven project when they were started, how long they took. You can open uh, details about them here. Um, like, OK, which execution was this? How long did it take? In this case, it was loaded from cache. But it was not zero, because of course, also loading from cache has some overhead. Um, so you can see that here, like fingerprinting inputs. That's the part where we compute the cache key. So we need to check all the inputs and um, yeah, compute the hash key. And um, also down here, you can see, OK, this, this was actually loaded from cache. And you can down see then it was a hit in a local cache. You can see the cache key that is, was computed, how big the cache artifact was, how many entries it had, how long it took to unpack it. All, all details are here um, for you to see. On the performance tab, you get an overview of, of uh, the total build time, um, also see how much time or how much memory was used in the build. On the goal execution tab, you can see uh, how many goals were actually avoided. So in this case, we had five goals that we didn't have to re-execute because we loaded them from cache. And you could also click on this and then show, see them all in a timeline because you can filter stuff here, and this is all the from cache goals. Um, yeah, you can see all kinds of details about the build cache, like how many hits that we have, how long did it take to unpack in total, or for each entry. Projects gives you an overview of the projects. Um, only a single project here, not very interesting. The plugins tab shows you all the plugins in all versions that were used, and you can see in, in which projects or sub-projects that were used. Yeah, so this is a Maven build scan. Let me show you the same for Gradle. So this is the last JNet5 build I executed here. And um, as you can see on the top, you can also add tags to your build scans. Um, you can also do that for Maven. I just haven't configured it. And you can add custom links. Uh, like, for example, I added a custom link that takes you to the git commit that was executed. And in this case, actually, it was the one that where I set up the local Gradle Enterprise server. So you can see I, I configured it to always publish a build scan. So I didn't have to type minus minus scan. I, uh, yeah, this is the custom link I just clicked on, basically taking the local git commit info and building a link. It also added it as a custom value here. And this is where I configured the, the tag. So if the CI environment 
variable is set, I'm going to add a CI tag, otherwise it's a local build. Yeah, and also the build cache configuration is done here. But don't have to go into details here. So this is um, the tag and the link. And for, for Cradle builds, you get a, a nicer overview right now. You get this, this timeline view, and that shows you, OK, I've been using a parallel execution. And um, you can you have this interactive chart here where you can like, uh, look at things and um, click on them. That gives you a nice, uh, an idea how, how good you were able to leverage the parallel execution stuff. Um, yeah, so for, for Cradle, you have this, this task view as well. Um, you can also hide it if you have a little space, like here. Um, yeah, you can see all kinds of information about the task, similar to the Maven build scan I showed earlier. One interesting thing is, um, which I didn't show, let me do this here now. Um, in a task that was loaded from cache, you can actually navigate to the build scan that produced the output of this task. So basically, it's a different build scan, and you can see, OK, in this, in this build, this task was actually executed, and the outputs were cached and were reused in the build I just clicked on. Um, that's also very helpful sometimes. The performance tab has a, a bit more information than for a Maven build scan. For example, it shows you a breakdown of the configuration time it took for the Gradle build. It also has more details about dependency resolution. In this case, everything was cached, so it's not very very interesting. But if you have a, like a build where nothing is cached, then it shows you details about how long it took to resolve dependencies. And also, the network activity tab shows you how long it took to download stuff. So for example, sometimes it's already insightful to have that to, to figure out, OK, I have a really slow connection of, on my CI server to my, I don't know, artifactory something uh, where, I have, where I get my dependencies from. Uh, maybe I should you know, either put the CI server in a different location or have a local mirror of that, that sort of thing. I also have task execution, uh, similar to the goal execution one on the, on the Maven tab. And it, it shows you, OK, 80% of the tasks were able to be avoided. They didn't have to be executed. And it's a breakdown from cache and up to date. And yeah, you can see, OK, lifecycle tasks were executed, how long it took in total to, to snapshot task inputs in order to determine if they could be loaded from cache. And you have a similar build cache tab as well. Similar projects, it's a list of um, all the projects in your build. In this case, it's a rather flat hierarchy with one parent project in JNet5 and all others are just direct children of that. Um, you can look at dependencies, something we will add for Maven 2. Um, right now, it's not there yet. So for example, you can check out the compile class path and see, OK, these are the dependencies that were used. Um, we can even check, OK, which repository were they downloaded from. Um, in this case, it's a snapshot. It was from Sonar type snapshot repository. Or this is in release. It was just downloaded from Maven Central. Um, yeah, you, get, you can take a look at which plugins were used, similar to the, the Maven build. These are all the Gradle plugins that were used and, and which version and, and which projects they were used. Um, yeah, custom values, again, shows you like the git commit that I've configured. Um, as a custom value here. And you can similarly browse like the switches that were used for the Gradle build and the infrastructure it was executed on. One more thing, I only showed um, basically Gradle Enterprise build scans, not public ones. So let me uh, give you a quick example of a public one. So this is just a simple uh, sample project if you just have a regular Gradle project and you have not set up anything, uh, no Gradle Enterprise server in your build script, um, you will get kind of this kind of uh, question at the end of your build um, because you're kind of uploading stuff to a public server, even though the link is not easily guessable, but still. So you have to agree to the terms of service. Once you've done that, um, yeah, you get a public build scan URL. So you can use that um, also for free on scansgradle.com, both for Gradle and for Maven builds. Especially if you work on open source projects, that's 
that's very useful. Um, you can link that, post that link on the GitHub issue and tell people, hey, I have an issue here, can you take a look, please? And, and yeah. All right. So as I said, both for Gradle and Maven, um, public scans are free. You have a little less features. Um, you don't have stuff like build comparisons and, and the performance dashboard. Let me briefly show you, show you those as well. So this is, again, the build scan of the JN5 project. I can go to the list of all scans here, which basically shows me all, all the, the build scans that were uploaded to this Gradle Enterprise server here. I can uh, filter them by project. I just want to chain it five, maybe. I can filter by build, by build tool. I can say, OK, just maybe the last 30 minutes. And those are the, the build scans I'm, I, I will see. Or I can filter by tag. For example, I only want to see CI builds, maybe, and only from Wednesday. And let's take a look at that. So you get the list of builds. Um, but also more interesting, you get a performance dashboard, like this one here. That shows you, OK, how long did it take for each build? Um, it shows you the, t the average build time here. You also have the percentiles um, over here, if you hover over it. So the average build time was about 32 seconds. And it also tells you, OK, if you had executed these tasks serially, not in parallel, it would have taken 3.2 times as long. Um, it shows you the, the savings. So all this, this gray stuff down here is actually not the time that was spent, but that would have been spent had the tasks been executed. So uh, you can also click on it and see, OK, by only up to date checks, we saved about 40 seconds. And the remote build cache saved another minute and 36 seconds for us on these builds. There's also the build cache overhead, just to stay true to ourselves that this it has some overhead, of course, but three seconds um, of overhead um, yeah, compared to two minutes and, and 16 seconds of savings is quite OK, I would say. Yeah, that's something I also wanted to show as a comparison real quick. Yeah, these two builds, and um, basically you can compare to build scans and see all the differences. Uh, so in this example, I updated a dependency and used the later version. So I updated from 1.1.1 to 1.2.0 snapshot. Um, and this is also then visible here in the build scan. You get a diff of custom values. So this was a different git commit I built. OK, so that's interesting. Um, you can also check the task inputs to find out why a task was executed again. In this case, for example, why was the jar task executed again? OK, uh, the manifest changed. So it has to be rebuilt, because probably the manifest contains some timestamp or something. Yeah, you get the same stuff for compile tasks. OK, something on the compile class path changed. So we had to recompile. This gives you really a nice tool to find out, OK, why was this build different than the other one? OK, and all these features, like the comparison, the performance dashboard, et cetera, they are only available in Gradle Enterprise, um, which you can have um, hosted on-premise, so it's on your own server, on your own infrastructure. What, what else? So Gradle Enterprise also provides an export API, so if you're not yet satisfied with that dashboard, you can build your own using the export API. You can listen for builds to come in. You can listen for events of builds as um, they are uploaded and build your own dashboard. There's even a sample project uh, I've linked here that shows you how to set up such a pipeline um, using Google stuff to uh, you know, build your own dashboard. And we've done that for um, our own builds. So these are our Cradle projects that are built on on CI, I think, or also local builds. And this shows you the total number of builds and the total build time by project. Um, you can build all kinds of analysis. All the data that's in a build scan basically is free for you to use. You can do the same for tests. So you can find out, OK, which tests are the slowest. Um, 
which tests fail the most often. Um, maybe they are flaky, and maybe you should look into that, or maybe they're just really good tests that find a lot of bugs, could also be. Um, so you can build all kinds of analysis. Um, you can also look at tasks or goals, um, which are the longest, which take the longest. Maybe you can optimize something there. Um, and also the, the trend over time is often very interesting. All right, last but not least, a couple of resources for you. Um, so we have free trainings for a lot of Gradle things um, on gradle.com slash training. There's also a build cache deep dive training that, that shows you more about the, the background, how it, how it works, and gives you some, some more yeah, advanced uh, stuff, the more than I can do today. And there's also a tutorial about using Maven and Gradle Enterprise. There's a YouTube channel that also has a lot of, lot of talks about Gradle um, and a lot of tutorials. And of course, if you want to learn more about the build tool, there's gradle.org. And if you want to learn more about Gradle Enterprise, that's gradle.com. Um, that has resources for you to, to read and documentation and everything. Yeah, so with that, um, we have some time for questions, I think. But before we do that, um, I just wanted to point you to my talk tomorrow, which is about JNet 5. Um, so tomorrow at 16.10. If you're interested in that, see you there. And with that, ciao yuku. <laughs> oh. And don't forget your Gradle stickers, right? So now questions, please. Hey. Um, hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, I have one quick question about uh, build caching. So as far as I understand, for example, if Gradle understands that there is a cached version of some task's output on the remote server, it will go ahead and fetch it. Is it correct? Kind of. Yeah, if you configured it that way, yes. Okay, so um, I'm imagining a situation where, for example, you do a lot of code generation, and the task execution time locally would be less than the time to fetch all the classes and data from the remote server. Mm -hmm. How would Gradle handle that? Would it be smart, or would it be straightforward? Well, it would not be smart in that way. It would, uh, first of all, not every task or goal is worth to make, be made cacheable. For example, something like the, the jar task I've shown, we don't cache that. It doesn't make sense because it's I.O. bound. It will take the same amount of time to download and extract it than just zip the class files that you already have. So you should think carefully about which tasks are worth to be made cacheable in the first place. So okay, yeah. that's basically our answer to that. All right, thanks. That kind of answers my question. And of course, build scans give you the, the numbers, like how long, how long did it take to, to download stuff from the remote cache? You have that on the task. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you. Hi, Mark. Uh, great talk. Um, I was wondering um, with remote cache and uh, your local execution, if you're running on a different operating system or a different JDK. Um, than the CI. Will it st still uh, download the, the remote cache uh, results? Well, it depends. So for comp compilation, the, the, of course, the compiler version is an input. So we, we don't attempt to kind of re re reuse that if, if the compiler was different. So if the Java version is different, we don't do that. And um, for test execution, if I remember correctly, we also take into account the operating system. Um, yeah, but like for compilation, we don't because the Java compiler should should do the same thing on, on Mac OS or on Linux or Windows, basically. But the, but the, if it's a different JDK version, I, I'm not sure if we take the update version into account, but at least the major version, I I, I would have to double check. But yeah. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm interested in Maven plugin or extension. Uh, does it support well uh, multimodal projects or parallel execution? Yes, it does. It supports both. Okay. And uh, can it handle um, such plugins that do obfuscation tasks? For example, ProGuard plugin that obfuscates all the classes after the compilation? Okay, so right now we only support a certain set of well known goals, of well known Maven plugins, basically. So uh, if this is a custom plugin, we would not cache its outputs. We, 
because in, in, in Maven, it's, there's no easy way to find out what, what are the inputs and outputs of each goal, mm -hmm. because uh, unlike in Gradle, there's, there's, the task or goals don't have to declare that. So we can't support any, any custom or any plugin just out of the box like that. But we will, at some point, probably provide an API for you to do that. So if you, if you have, for example, have a custom plugin, I'm, I'm not sure that's the case. Is this just some, is this some company custom plugin, or is this some other obfuscation thing? Yeah, it's company custom plugin. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, for that, we will provide an API for you to make your own goals cacheable. Basically, you would have to declare, okay, these are the inputs, which in your case would be the unobfuscated class files, and then the output location, like where, where you put the obfuscated class files would be the output. So that's, that's basically how, how you would do it. I see. And one more question related to the remote cache. Um, usually we do build on CI, mm -hmm. and we have lots of developers that um, having Git flow implementation. In the process, we have multi-branch projects with lots of changes in different areas. Does it work to use remote cache in this situation at all, in case we, we change a lot of code in different areas, and actually we need to invalidate all the pieces each time? Or is better to use only local cache. So you mean on CI to use a local cache on CI? Well, it really depends how you set up your CI agents. If you have a, like an ephemeral CI agent that gets like, spun up every time with a fresh Docker image, doesn't reuse any local state, then using the local cache is kind of pointless. But if you have like, long-lived CI agents that, that live for a certain amount of time and are reused by subsequent builds, then the local cache can be beneficial because you don't yeah. have to download stuff that much. But I, I can, even on the one agent, for example, talking about Jenkins here, mm -hmm. I can use one agent to run, let's say, 10 builds in parallel, 10 different branches with different uh, changes in each okay. branch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's safe to use in parallel. So uh, as long as, I mean, there are some restrictions like, uh, for Gradle, if you use like a Docker container for each of these builds on the same host, then sharing the local build cache does not work that well, because just for, because for the networking that has to go on for for making sure that there are no concurrent writes to the same local cache. But if you run them like just as regular processes on the same host, then it would be fine. Then we synchronize access to the local cache and make sure there's no conflicts. Mm -hmm. And what? One more question about the overhead of using the cache. Do we have, or could you just highlight quickly what is the requirements for adding the cache for the builds? In case we have a large project that takes a huge amount of time to build, what? It really depends a lot. So we, we have the build scans to, to show the data for each build. This is why we think uh, doing build caching without having such insights like the build scans have is really kind of, is really hard at least. Um, so you kind of need those numbers. And if there's too much overhead, you need to look at why and for which goals. And it's, it's, there's no general answer, really. So for some projects, it's quite low. I mean, we've seen the JNet project. We had like, I don't know, was it three seconds overhead um, for the build cache? Um, and the average build time was about uh, 30 seconds using the cached results. So if we had not used the cache, it would have been two minutes more or something like that. So it, it's hard to tell, hard to give you one number, really, um, which is when we have a new customer, we always do a trial. Uh, we let them try it. Um, we, we can we help them analyze the, the results and, and investigate why something maybe has a bigger overhead than expected. So that's the best answer I can give you right now. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I want to um, ask about a question about, uh, is it possible to tune this remote cache? Uh, for example, change caching eviction algorithm, change in time to leave for the cache records. So it's all configurable for uh, both remote and local cache, right? Yes, you can configure like time to live, how often it gets cleaned up, uh, and that's, that sort of thing, yeah. Yes, even uh, uh, for this uh, uh, not outsourced version, uh, how to say, uh, this uh, free version, yeah? The free version, the free remote cache. Um, yeah, I think it has the same administration view than the other one. I've not used it that often, to be honest, so I would have to double check. Okay. But yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for presentation. 
uh, not strictly related to the performance of Gradle, but uh, um, in the past there were some issues supporting uh, Java 9 module system in Gradle. Um, maybe there is, you have some update or uh, info about this? Well, it really depends on what you want to do. Um, so Gradle does not have any, any native support for the Java module system yet. Um, there are a couple plugins out there that you can, that you can use, for example, to, uh, uh, yeah, to use the module path for test execution, that sort of thing. Um, and they all work. So at this point, there's just so many ways to use the module system. There's like, uh, I don't know, a myriad of new compiler flags. And um, yeah, so we don't have any, any built-in support for it right now. But you can customize the compiled Java task, for example, to pass the release flag or stuff like that. So it's all possible with Gradle. And there's, there's plugins that, that support you in certain use cases. Um, but we don't, by default, now do any module-specific things. But do you plan to add it in the future, or it's like will, will be done by plugins for, forevermore? Well, I think for now we're satisfied with the current state that we have that there are, there are community plugins by uh, also by, by people who, who are really experienced in the module system, like some book authors wrote the one plugin, I think, and um, in our opinion, that's good enough for now. Okay. Any more questions? There's one. Thank you for Thanks for talking. Uh, short question. Do we have a possibility to configure it where we are getting the cache? I mean, uh, for some task, I, I don't care where it comes, uh, remote or, or local, or, but for some task, I want that it, it will be only for local. I didn't get the first part. So we, I mean, uh, we have cash from uh, for some tasks, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't care if, if for one task it will come or for local cash or for remote. Uh, but for some tasks, I want that it will be only from local to uh, from local cash. Okay, why would you want that? Mm. <laughs> I didn't. I, I did imagine this situation, but. Let's imagine that I need. Uh, I don't know why, still. But uh, the question, if the, there is a possibility to configure it like this. Uh, not that I know of. I think right now you have, can enable or disable the local and remote cache separately. So you can use both or just one of them. But, but not for tasks. Not on, the, not on the task level, no. OK, thank you. Anything else? Doesn't look like it. So if not, I'm, I'm going to be around until tomorrow evening, basically. So if you have questions, feel free to approach me and, and talk to me. Thanks. <laughs>